Good day, dear students. I am Chimidonov Sergei Nikolaevich, the head of Human Anatomy Department in Samara State Medical University. And today we will talk about the questions of particular arthrosyndesmology. And you will see the plan of la our lecture. And first we will talk about vertebras, connections between vertebras and vertebral column as a whole. Next we'll talk about chest as a whole. Next we'll talk about temporal mandibular joint, about shoulder joint, and joints of the forearm with hand, wrist joints, and joints of the hand. And first we'll talk about vertebral column. The joints between the vertebra in men reflect the course of their phylogenesis, as mentioned above initially in Cordata, the actual skeleton has the character of an artifact, the remnants of which persist in men is the nucleus pulposus. You may see it on this picture. The vertebral column, which replaced the notochord, acquired a segmental structure, preserved in men in the form of a series of bone segments, the vertebra. That's why joints develop between the vertebra. At first, these joints were continuous. They were synetrosis, which, according to the three stages of the development of the skeleton in general and vertebral column, in particular, initially had the character of syndesmosis. Synchondrosis then occurred along with syndesmosis, and finally, synostosis developed in the sacral region, you know this, with the gradual change to terrestrial life and improvement of the mode of movement interrupt joints, diatrosis, also developed between the vertebra. In some mammals, they form between the vertebral bodies and between the arches by means of special articular processes. Since anthropoids showed a tendency to walk upright, greater stability of the vertebral column was necessary. Therefore, the joints between the vertebral bodies again start to acquire a continuous character, although the process was not complete and half joints, hammer outrosis formed in some parts. As a result of such development, the human vertebral column has all types of joints, syndesmosis, ligaments between the transverse and spinous processes, synolastosis, ligaments between the arches, synchondrosis between the bodies of a series of vertebra, and synostosis between the sacral vertebra. And also we have hematrosis between the bodies of the series of vertebra and diatrosis between the articular processes. All these articulations are segmental in structure in accordance with the metametric development of the spine. Since a separate vertebra formed a single vertebral column, longitudinal ligaments form, which stretch along the entire spine and reinforce a single structure. As a result, all the articulations between vertebra may be divided according to the two main parts of the spine, into articulations between the bodies and articulations between the arches. So first we will talk about joints between vertebral bodies. You may see on this picture the vertebral bodies forming the vertebral column proper which suffer the trunk uh, unit one with other, uh, and also with the sacrum, by means of synchondrosis called the intervertebral cartilaginous or discs, dischi intervertebrales, it's in Latin, or by means of the hematrosis if there are clefts between them. Each disc is a fibrocartilaginous plate whose periphery is formed concentric layers of connective tissue fibers. These fibers form very strong peripheral fibrous ring, amulus fibrosus, while the center part of the plate 
is gelatinosis nucleus, nucleus pulposus is in Latin, consisting of the soft fibrous cartilage, a remnant of the notochord. This nucleus is under considerable pressure and continuously tends to distend. On cross section of the disc, it produces mainly above the level of the section and is therefore resilient and acts as a buffer. The intervertebral discs correspond to vertebral bodies in shape, but are somewhat wider and protrude consequently over the edge of the vertebral bodies as swellings. The discs are thickest where mobility is greatest, in the lumbar region maybe, at least thick between the thoracic vertebra. The column of vertebral bodies, united by the intervertebral discs, is reinforced by two longitudinal ligaments. You may see on this picture, running in front and back at the median line, the anterior longitudinal ligament, ligamentum lumbricidurale anterius, it's in Latin, stretch on the anterior surface of the vertebral body and discs. Uh, it goes from the tubercle on the anterior arch of the atlas to the upper part of the pelvic surface of the atlas where is, not, where is lost in the periosteum. This ligament prevents abnormal backward extension of the spine. The posterior longitudinal longitudinal ligament, ligamentum longitudinale posterius, you may see on this picture, uh, extends from the second cervical vertebra downwards on the posterior surface of the vertebral bodies in vertebral canal to the upper end of the canalis sacralis. It hinders flexion, uh, it uh, hinders flexion and is a functional antagonist of the anterior longitudinal ligament. Next, we'll talk about joints between the vertebral arches. Uh, on this picture, you may see uh, anterior and posterior longitudinal ligaments. And next, we'll talk about intervertebral arches and uh, joints between vertebral arches. The arches are united by joints and ligaments located both between the arch themselves and between their processes. Union between articular processes is accomplished by intervertebral joints, articulationes intervertebrae. You may see them on this picture. Uh, Since these are flat, tight joints, which are limited in movement, they limit flexibility of the spine and give it a definite direction in conformity with the position of the articular surfaces in the different parts of the spine, multi-axial joints. The spaces between the arch are filled by elastic fibers. You may see that fibers on these pictures. <clears throat> and they are called yellow fibers, layer, uh, yellow ligaments, or ligamenta flava in Latin. Because of their elasticity, elasticity, they tend to bring the arch closer to each other and together with the resilience of the intervertebral cartilages <clears throat> and contribute to a straight spine and upright position. The ligaments between the spinous processes, you may see on this picture, uh, the interspinosis ligaments, ligamenta interspinalia, are developed most markedly in the lumbar region, a roundish band continues with the interspinosus ligaments in the back stretch over the apices uh, of the spinous process <clears throat> as a long 
supraspinous ligament, ligamentum supraspinale. You may see this ligament on this picture. This is interspinal ligament, this is supraspinal ligament. In cervical part of the spine, the interspinous ligaments are stretched beyond the epicysis of the spinal processes and form the sagittal nuchal ligament, ligamentum nuchae. Uh, you may see it on this picture, ligamentum nuchae. It's triangular. One of its sides is attached to the spinal processes, another the external occipital crest, while the third free side stretches from the seventh cervical vertebra to the external occipital protuberance. It's seven, seventh cervical vertebra, you may see on this picture. Um, the Newhall ligament is most conceptuous in quadruplets, especially a cattle, and helps to support the head. In men who walk upright, it is less pronounced, together with the <coughs> terspinals and supraspinals uh, ligaments, it hinders excessive forward flexion of the spine and head. Ligaments between the transverse process, the intertransverse, intertransverse ligaments, ligamenta intertransversaria, limit lateral movements of the spine to the contralateral side. So next we will talk about joints between sacrum and uh, coccyx. The joints between the sacrum and coccyx are similar to those between the vertebra described above, but are less pronounced because the coccygeal vertebra are rudimentary. The body of the fifth sacral vertebra unites uh, with coccyx by means of the intervertebral cartilage. Um, the cartilage has a small cavity in which and it which allow uh, the coccyx to bend backward during childbirth. The anterior sacrococcygeal ligament, ligamentum sacrococcygeale ventrale, you may see it on this picture, passes on the anterior surface of the coccyx and is continuous with the anterior longitudinal ligament. You may see the anterior longitudinal ligament on this picture. The deep posterior sacrococcygeal ligament, ligamentum sacrococcygeum uh, dorsale profundum, similar to the posterior longitudinal ligament of the spine, lies deeper on the posterior surface, the superficial posterior sacrococcygeal ligament. Ligamentum sacra coccygeum dorsalis superficiale, it's in Latin, is closer to the first surface and corresponds to the yellow ligaments and the capsules of the intervertebral joints. The lateral sacra coccygeal ligaments, ligamenta sacra coccygea laterale, it's in Latin, uh, are homologous with the intertransverse ligaments, ligamenta intertransversale, and are therefore attached to the transverse processes of the coccyx together with the grooves at the apex of the sacrum they form the fifth sacral foramen. Next we will talk about the union of the vertebral column with the skull. You can see that unions um, of this picture. The vertebral column is joined to the skull by a combination of several joints permitting movement on three axes in the bow and socked joint. The Atlanta occipital joint, Articulatio Atlanta occipitalis. You may see it on this picture, and also you may see articular facets on Atlas. Um, so, the Atlanta occipital joint is a condylar joint. 
It's formed by two candles of the occipital bones. Uh, Uh, spondyl occipitalis and the concave articular surfaces uh, facets of the atlas. Fovea articularis superioris atlantis, it's in Latin. Both pairs of the articulating surfaces are enclosed in separate articular capsules but move simultaneously, forming a single combined joint. The posterior atlantic occipital membrane, uh, membrana atlantic occipitalis posterior, located between the posterior arch of the atlas and the posterior margin of the foramen magnum. Uh, the atlantic occipital joint allows movement of two axes, the frontal and sagittal, nodding, bending the head backward and forward uh, in a sign of ascent takes place on the frontal axis, lateral bending on the head to the right and left, abduction and abduction occur on the sagittal axis, like this, flexion and extends and abduction and abduction to the right and to the left side. The interior and of the axis stands somewhat higher than the posterior end. As a result, for its oblique position of the axis, the head usually turns slightly to the contralateral side when it flexes laterally. The atlas and axial vertebras unite by means of three joints, two lateral atlanta axial joints. Articulationes atlanta axialis lateralis, it's in Latin, are formed by inferior articular surface of the atlas and the similar superior surfaces of the axis contiguous to them, thus making up a combined joint. The adentoid process, like dance, you may see it on this picture, um, dense axis, it's in Latin, Located in the middle uh, is joined with the anterior arch, interior arch of the atlas and transverse ligament of the atlas. You may see this transfer ligament here on this picture. Uh, ligamentum transversum atlantis, it's in Latin. Uh, Transverse ligament stretch between the inner surfaces of the lateral masses in atlas. The transverse ligaments uh, is fibrocartilaginous as its articulations with the dens. The dens is therefore enclosed in the osteofibrosis ring formed by the anterior arch of the atlas and the transverse ligaments as a result of which a trochoid joint forms, the median atlanta axial joint, articulatio atlanta axialis median. Two fibrous bands which has separated from the posterior longitudinal ligament of the spine arise from the superior and inferior edges of the transverse ligament. One stretch upward to the anterior edge uh, of the foramen magnum the other passes downward to the posterior surface of the axial body. Together with the transfer ligament, these two bands from the cruciform, from the cruciform, you may see this cruciform ligament of the axis, ligamentum cruciforme atlantis, it's in Latin. This ligament is a very important function the articular surface for the dance and directs its movements and it prevents dislocation of the dance, which might injure the spinal cord or medulla oblongata, located close to the foramen magnum, in condition that is fatal. In accessory ligaments of the joint described is the apical ligament of the odontoid process, ligamentum Apicis dentis, you may see this ligament on this picture. Uh, 
Um, it's extending from the tip of the dance to the interior edge of the foramen magnum. Two strong ligaments, alar ligaments, you may see that on this picture. Uh, alar ligaments of the edentoid proboscis, ligamenta alaria, laterally of edentoid proboscis, pass from a lateral surface of the dens and a attached to the medial surface of the candles of the occipital bell. The whole apparatus of ligaments described is covered posteriorly from the aspect of the vertebral canal by the membrana tectoria stretched from the clevus of the sphenoid of the um, of the occipital bone and anterior edge of the foramen magnum. You may see uh, the uh, membrana tectoria uh, tectorial membrane uh, on this picture. Uh, so um, the Atlanta axial joints permit only a single type of movement, rotation of the head on the vertical axis. When we say no, rotation on vertical axis. Uh, so turning right and left. Um, movements occur at the same time as the lateral atlanta axle joints. During rotation, the tip of the dance is held in place by the above mentioned ligament area, which regulates movement and, in this manner, protects the neighboring spinal cord from jarring. The joints between the skull and the two tericol vertebra permit only slight movements. A wider range of movements of head is usually produced with the participation of the whole cervical part of the spine. The cranial vertebral joints are most highly developed in men because of this upright posture and erect position of the head. Vertebral column as whole. The vertebral column grows gradually thicker from the skull to the first sacral vertebra and then diminishes rapidly and ends at the tip of the coccyx. Such rapid narrowing of the lower part of the vertebral column is sacrum and coccyx. Although the spine is a vertical column, is not straight but curved in the sagittal plane. The curvatures in the thoracic and sacral parts are posteriorly convex, uh, while those in the cervical and lumbar segments are anteriorly convex. A curvature posteriorly convex is called kyphosis. You may see this term on this picture. An entirely convex curvature is called low doses. Low doses. The spine of a newborn is almost straight and the curvatures are hardly firm. Uh, when the infant begins to raise his head, a curvature forms in the neck or cervical part. And the head whose greatest part is held to the front of the spine tends to bend down. To hold the head raised, the spine curves forward. Uh, the child repeated attempts to raise the head and hold it in that position by contraction of the posterior muscles of the head facility the formation of the curvature. As a result, a terical low doses Forms. You may see this a low doses on this picture. Then, when a sitting posture is adopted, the thoracic kyphosis increases, and later, when the child learns to stand and walk, the main curvature, the lumbar low doses, forms. With the formation of the lumbar low doses, 
the pelvis um, the pelvis to which the limbs are attached tilts to remain in the vertical position the spine must curve in the lumbar region as a result of which the center of gravity is displaced to the back of the hip joint axis. This prevents the trunk from falling forward. The appearance of two lordoses causes the development of two kyphoses, thoracic and sacrococcygeal. You may see that kyphoses on this picture, thoracic and coccygeal. Sacrococcygeal kyphoses. Uh, the appearance uh, of two lordoses causes the development of two kyphoses associated with the maintenance of balance in a vertical body posture which distinguish men from the other animals. The spinal curvatures are maintained by the active retaining force of the muscles, by ligaments and by the shape of the vertebra themselves. This is important for the same point of keeping a stable balance without abnormal expenditure of muscle strain, owing to its elasticity, the spine carrot in this manner bears the weight of the head, upper limbs and trunk with springy resistance. With increase in the loud, the spinal carriages in increase, uh, when the loud reduce, they become smaller, the spinal curvatures are important and they, they absorb the jerks and shocks directed along the spine, in jumping and even in simple walking. The first <clears throat> of the shock is spent on the creasing the curvature without reaching fully the skull and the brain at full force. Besides the mentioned curvatures, um, in the sagittal plane, a less pronounced convex to the right, um, a thoracic curvature in the frontal plane is detectable. This is lateral curvature, called scoliosis, has been given different explanations. According to the latest data, uh, it is a pathological condition not inherent in healthy individuals and it's quite after birth. For instance, met lateral deformity of the spine may develop in school children who sit motionless for a long time in a poor <clears throat> bent posture, particularly when writing. The condition uh, is called school scoliosis. Um, some occupations involve habitual distortions of the trunk also lead to drastic scholars. Rational physical exercises, you know, are necessary to prevent scholars. At old age, uh, the spine loses its curvatures because of diminution of the intervertebral discs and a vertebra and the loss of elasticity. The spine bends forward, forming a single big curvature. Senior humpback or senior kyphosis. Uh, the vertebral column becomes much shorter. Its length in old age may reduce by 5 or 6 centimeters. Movement of the vertebral column. The spine forms a flexible and elastic vertical column by means of the intervertebral cartilages and ligaments. Two elastic Systems, uh, two elastic systems, uh, counteract each other in this column. The cartilages prevent the vertebrae from coming close to one another, while the ligaments prevent them from drawing far apart. It can be seen from the description of the vertebral joints allow that the range of the movement between two adjacent vertebrae cannot be wide. Owing to the great number of segments composing the vertebral column, 
However, the sum total of small range movements between the vertebral land, the whole spine rather considerably mobility. This mobility differs in different parts of the spine. The cervical and upper lumbar parts are most mobile, while the thoracic part is least mobile because it's connected to the ribs. The sacrum is absolutely immobile. Movements of the following axis are possible in vertebral column. The frontal axis, flexion forward to the angle of 160 degrees and extension backward to the angle uh, of 140 degrees. The sagittal axis, <coughs> abduction and adduction, um, binding to the right and left with a common amplitude of 160 degrees. Uh, vertical axis, rotation of the trunk, turning to the right and left with a common amplitude of 120 degrees. Circumduction is also possible as well as location and shortening of the spine through an increase of diminution of the spinal curvatures in contraction or relaxation of the corresponding muscles springy movement. So next we'll talk about thoracic cage as a whole. Thoracic cage, or compagus thoracis, it's in Latin, is ovoid with a narrow upper end and wider lower end. Both ends are cut slantwise, the upper part from the front upward to the back, and the lower part in the opposite direction. In addition, the thorax is somewhat compressed from front to back. The anterior wall, of which the sternum, sternum uh, is a component, is shorter than the posterior wall, in the formation of which the vertebral column takes part. The thoracic cavity, common thoracis, has two apertures. The superior aperture, superior aperture, uh, superior aperture, you may see it on this picture, uh, apertura towards the superior and the inferior aperture, outlet, apertura towards the inferior, which is closed by muscular partition, the diaphragm. The interior body of the inferior aperture has an incisive shape like an angle, you may see it on this picture the infrasternal angle of the thorax, angulus infrasternalis. The siphon process uh, is located at its apex. The vertebral column protrudes into the thoracic cavity of the midline and above mentioned white pulmonary sources, sulci pulmonaris, formed to the sides of the column between it and the ribs. You may see salsi on this picture between vertebra and vertebras and ribs. Um, the posterior margins of the lungs are lodged in them. The spaces between the ribs are called intercostals, intercostals spaces, spazia intercostalis. In mammals, the thoracic viscera uh, exert pressure of the inferior wall because of their horizontal posture and the thoracic cage is long and narrow. Uh, so you may see um, uh, it uh, on this picture. Um, the ventral dorsal dimension is larger uh, than the transverse dimension. As a result of which the thorax appears compressed of the sides and its ventral wall protrudes like the keel of a boat, keel or pigeon chest. Uh, in monkeys, uh, the hands and feet are distinguished and to begin acquiring a vertical posture. The thoracic cage is wider and shorter, 
but the vector dorsal dimension still predominates over transverse dimension, monkey chest. Finally, in human, with the final change to an upright position, uh, the hand is freed from the function of locomotion and becomes the organ of labor, as a result of which the thorax experiences uh, the traction of the upper limb muscles attached to it. The viscera exert pressure uh, not on the ventral wall, like in, anim in, anim in animals, um, which is now the anterior wall, but on the inferior wall formed by a diaphragm. As a consequence, the line of weight in the vertical posture of the body is displaced closer to the vertebral column. As a result, the thoracic cavity becomes flat and wide, <clears throat> so the transverse dimension, uh, you may see it on the right picture, uh, predominates over the anterior, anterior posterior dimension. In reflection of this process of phylogenesis, the chest changes in shape during ontogenesis. As a child gradually begins to stand, walk and use his limbs, the whole locomotor system and the viscera grow and develop, the thorax gradually takes the shape characteristic of the human chest with the predominance of the transverse dimension. The shape and size of the thorax Age is also marked by considerable individual variation consequent upon the degree of the development of the muscles and lungs, which is turn is associated with the lifestyle and occupation of the given person. Since the chest, chest contains such vitally important organs as a heart, lungs, these variations are very important in evaluating the physical development of a individual and diagnostic internal diseases. Three chest shapes are usually distinguished. Uh, uh, you may see three chest shapes on this picture. Uh, flat chest, barrel chest and conic chest. Um, barrel like cylindric. So, Individuals with a well-developed muscle and lungs have wide but short thoracic cage, which acquires a conic shape. Its lower part is wider than the upper part. Um, the ribs slope only slightly and the infrasternal angle is large. Such a thorax um, appears to be in a state of inspiration and therefore caught in an inspiratory chest. In contrast, in individuals with a weak development of muscles and lungs, the thoracic cage is narrow and long and acquires a flat shape with gritty flattened anterior posterior diameter. The interior wall is almost vertical. They are rib slope mapped and the infrasternal angle is acute. Um, the thorax appears to be a state of the expiration and therefore called expiratory. The barrel chest occupies um, an intermediate position between the two curves. As the same uh, term is cylindrical. Uh, the barrel chest um, uh, between two of these curves. The femoral chest is shorter and narrower in the lower part and more rounded than the male chest. So, you may see on this picture Q-shaped abnormal chest and also funnel-shaped abnormal chest. Uh, this is abnormal. Uh, chest. Uh, next we'll talk uh, about um, 
temporomandibular joint. Uh, temporomandibular joint is formed by the head of the mandible and mandibular fossa of the temporal bone. The articulating surface are complemented by a fibrous articular disc, discus articularis, located between them. The edges of the disc are joined to the articular capsule as a result of which the joint cavity is separated into two isolated compartments. The articular capsule is attached along the border of the mandibular fossa up to the petrotympanic fissure and thus enclose the articular tubercle uh, and embraces the neck of the mandible inferiorly. Near the temporomandibular joint are three ligaments, only one of which, the lateral ligament, is directly related to the joint. It passes obliquely backward on the lateral side of the joint. From the zygomatic uh, process of the temporal bone to the neck uh, of the cantilar process of mandible. The lateral ligament prevents excessive uh, movement of the articular head uh, to the back. The remaining two ligaments, uh, ligamentum sphenomandibulare uh, and ligamentum stiomandibulare. You may see this ligament on this picture. Um, the remaining two ligaments uh, are at a distance from the joint and are actually not uh, actually not structured to help to suspend this mandibule. Um, both temporal mandibular joints function simultaneously and are therefore single combined articulation from the mechanical standpoint. The temporomandibular articulation is a candelar joint, uh, but because of the articular disc, it permits movements in three directions. The mandible makes the following movement, downward and upward movements with the opening and closure of the mouth, uh, forward and backward movements, and third, lateral movements, rotation of the mandible to the right and to the left, as a cutis in a chewing. The first of these movements is made in the lower compartment of the joint, between the articular disc and the articular head. When the mandible moves downwards, its <coughs> heads first glide together with a disc's first face and then rotate on the transverse axis passing through both heads, second face. To open the mouth wide, the heads glide forward and downward with the disc into uh, articular tubercles uh, that prevent dislocation of the jaw. Movement of the second type occurs in the upper compartment of the joint, also in two phases. The head glides forward with the disc to the articular tubercle, phase one, and then glides to the, on the tubercle and at the same time rotates about the transverse axis phase 2. In lateral movements, third type, the articular head and disc of only on site leave the articular fossa and approach the articular tubercle while the contralateral head remains uh, in the articular fossa and rotates on the vertical axis. But also we can see a small video about temporal mandibular joint. They're shaped quite differently. You may see uh, caput mandibulae, uh, mandible neck. All of them are from uh, condyle processes, and also you can see uh, articular cartilage of mandibular fossa in temporal bone. Also, you can see articular tubercle. Now you will see a uh, temporal mandibular joint with capsule and lateral ligament. The capsule yeah. is thin and loose. Here are the various movements that we'll see.
you also may see movements in joint and lateral ligament. Now we can see the disc, articular disc. It has S-shaped form. Here's the articular disc by itself. It's thin in front and thick behind. You may see it's not played, it has curvatures. And now we will see the movements in the joint. Are a hinging movement and a forward and backward gliding movement. The hinging movement takes place between the condyle and the disc. You may see the backward and forward uh, take place mainly the movements and temporal surface. Downward and upward and downward so forward and backward. Is a combination of the two movements. Downward and upward. If you put your finger here, you can feel the condyle moving forward as the jaw opens. So there was small video about temporal mandibular joint. Uh, next we'll talk about uh, shoulder joint. So shoulder joint, articulatio humeri, it's in Latin, uh, connects the humerus and throughout uh, through through it, sorry, the cool free upper limb with the shoulder girdle, the scapula in particular, the head of the humerus contributing the formation of the joint is spherical. The glenoid cavity of the scapula articulated with a shallow. On the circumference of the cavity is a cartilaginous glenoid leaf. You may see on this picture a labrum glenoidale it's in Latin, which increases its depth without limiting the range of movements and also absorbs jerks and shocks during movement of the head of humerus. Uh, an articular capsule of the shoulder joint is free and thin. It's attached uh, to the bone edge of the scapular glenoid cavity embraces the humeral head and terminates on the anatomical neck of humerus. It bridges the intertubicular groove uh, with a long head of the biceps muscle lodged here. You may see the bicep tender of long head of mass, bicep, biceps muscle on this picture and on this, these pictures too. The articular capsule uh, is thin. Coracohumeral ligament, ligamentum coracohumerale, um, stretching from the root of the coracoid process to the greater uh, to the greater tubercle of the humerus is slightly thicker bunch of fibers serving as accessory ligament. All in all, the shoulder plate has no true ligaments, and it's held in place by the muscles of the shoulder girdle. It's very important. I repeat. Uh, the shoulder blade has no true ligaments and is held in place by the muscles of the shoulder girdle. The circumstance is, on the one hand, conductive uh, to the wide range of movement as the shoulder joint necessary for the functioning of the limb as an organ of labor. On the other hand, it is weak fixation of the shoulder joint and it causes to frequent dislocations. The synovial membrane 
lining the capsule of the joint has two extra articular protrusions. The first, the intertubicular synovial shells, uh, vagina synovialis intertubicularis, vagina synovialis intertubicularis, it's in Latin, uh, encompasses the long head of the bicep muscle, passing in this, uh, uh, placing in this um, place, in this groove, like a cylinder. The other protrusion, the subtendinous bursa of the subscapularis muscle, bursa subtendinea musculis subscapularis, um, is above the upper part of the subscapular muscle and extends to the root of the caracoid process. The soldier, shoulder joint, typical bow and socket joint, is distinguished by a freedom of movement. As with all joints of the general type movement, um, shoulder joint takes place on three main axes, frontal, sagittal and vertical. Circumduction is also possible in movement of the frontal axis, anterior flexion and retracing of the arm to the level of the shoulder and posterior flexion or extension occurs the range of extension is less than range of flexion. Abduction raising the arm away from the side of the trunk to the level of the shoulder and abduction uh, lowering of the arm back and uh, to the side of the trunk take place in movement on the sagittal axis. Medial and lateral rotation of the arm occurs on the vertical axis. The pivotal uh, axis does not coincide with the axis of the humerus but it corresponds to the so called constructional axis of the upper limb, which passes from the center of the shoulder joint to the head uh, or the radius to the head of the ulna or ulna. As was pointed out above, forward raising and abduction of the arm. Um, are possible only to the shoulder level because forward movement is stopped by tightening of the articular capsule uh, and abutment uh, of the upper end of the humerus against about formed by cranial process of the scapula and the caracaracral ligament. You may see uh, a cranial process, uh, caracoid process and ligament uh, coracacromial ligament between these processes. The arm is raised above the shoulder not by movement of the shoulder joint, but by movement of whole limb together with the shoulder girdle, and the scapula in this case rotates with its inferior angle to the front and laterally. The human upper limb possesses a high degree of freedom of movement. Uh, the feeling, freeing of the upper limb was the, uh, the decisive step in man's evolutionary processes. The shoulder joint, as a consequence, became the first articulation of the human body. Uh, as a result, we can reach any part of our body with the hand and manipulate with the hands in all directions. The capacity is extremely important in everyday life and work. Next, we we'll talk some words about wrist joint and joint of hand bones. The joints of the hand uh, articulationis mouse. And first, we will talk about uh, wrist joint. Uh, it's, uh, in Latin, articulatio radio carpea. In most mammals, it's poorly shaped, and the ulna and radius contribute equally to its formation. With the gradual development of pronation and supination, a separate joint develops between the radius and ulna, the distal radial ulnar joint, here, Articulatio radio ulnaris distalis. Together, 
With the proximal radial ulnar joint, it forms a single complex articulation with a vertical pivotal axis. In this complex joint, the radius moves about the ulna, as a consequence of which the distal radial epiphysis becomes much larger. The development of the distal ulnar epiphysis, in contrast, is delayed and it becomes shorter than the radial epiphysis. You may see on this picture. But to make up for this a special cartilaginous disc, discus articularis, appears on it. In humans, due to the greatest range of supination and pronation, the disc becomes highly developed and acquires the shape of the triangular fibrocartilaginous plate, fibrocartilago triangulare, it's in Latin. Its apex fuses um, with the styloid process of the ulna. The base with the medial border of the radius and together with the carpoarticular surface of the radius and triangular fiber cartilaginous plate form the articular concave surface of the proximal part of the hand joints. The ulna, therefore, participates in the wrist joint only by means of the cartilaginous disc and is not directly related to it. The proximal part of the hand joints is consequently called the radial carpal and not the antibrachial carpal joint. Accordingly, the concave carticular surface of the radial carpal joint is formed by the carpal articulate surface of the radius and the triangular disc, while uh, the articular head is formed by a proximal surface of the prostral carpals, the scaphoid, tracheal and uh, tracheal and uh, lunate, lunate bones, which are united into intercarpal ligaments, ligamenta intercarpea. You may see the ligaments of this picture. According to the number of bones forming, each joint is complex, while according to the shape of the articular surfaces, it's a lipsoid joint with two pivotal axes, sagittal and frontal. You may take uh, flexion and extension movements and uh, adduction and abduction movements. Uh, the distal part of mediocarpal and midcarpal joint, articulatio mediocarpea, is located between two rows, two rows of carpal bones. You may see this joint on this picture with my arrow. Uh, so the concave articular surface of this joint is formed by a distal surface of the first row of carpal. The proximal surface of the second row of carpals, consisting of the trapezium, trapezoidum, and capitatum uh, and hematum bones. You may see these bones on this picture. Uh, this is trapezium, trapezoidum, uh, capitatum, and hematum bones. Um, they all they bone all these bones. Uh, form the articular head. Both carpal joints, radial carpal and mid-carpal possess their own articular capsules attached to the margins of the articular surfaces. Accessory ligaments reinforce the capsule of the radial carpal joint of the radial and ulnar sides. Uh, these are the lateral ligaments. Lateral ligaments. You may see on this picture ligamentum collaterale carpi radiale and ligamentum collaterale carpi ulnare. It's Latin. Um, on the palmar surface, on the radiocarpal joint, it's anterior radiocarpal. Uh, anterior uh, radiocarpal ligament. 
Ligamentum radiocarpeum palmare. A broad band originating at the styloid process of the border uh, of the articular surface of the radius and attached uh, of this picture, you may see it, and attached in the form of several bands to the scaphoid lined of the triquetral and capitated bones, uh, proximal part of carpal. So, at the dorsal surface, the capsule of radial carpal joint reinforced by the posterior radial carpal ligament, ligamentum radial carpium dorsale. You may see it on this picture. Uh, passing from the radius to the bones of the first carpal row. The capsule of the mid-carpal joint also encompasses the four last carpal metacarpal joint uh, which communicate. Besides the mid-carpal joint, there are intercarpal joints, articulationes intercarpia. You may see these joints on this picture. formed by some of the carpal bones are interconnected by the interosseous you may see these ligaments on these pictures interosseous intercarpal ligaments uh, ligamenta intercarpia interossa and articulating with one another by continuous articulation surfaces the intercarpal joints are strengthened by various short ligaments passing for the most part transversely from one bone to another on the dorsal surface by posterior intercarpal ligaments, ligamenta intercarpia dorsale, and on the palmar surface by anterior intercarpal ligaments, uh, ligamenta intercarpalia palmare. In addition, fibrous bands spread from the capitated bone, uh, capitated bone, Um, to the palmar surface uh, to the neighboring bones. This is the radiocarpal ligaments, ligamentum carpi radiatum. You may see these ligaments on this picture. Movements at the joints of the hand take place on two mutually perpendicular axes uh, passing through the head of the capitated bone <coughs> upon the frontal axis palmar flexion and extension, or dorsal flexion, and on the sagittal axis, radial abduction and abduction of ulnar abduction. These movements are restricted by ligaments stretching perpendicular to end at the end of the pivotal axis, uh, namely the collateral ligaments on the ends of the frontal axis and the dorsal and palmar ligaments on the ends of the sagittal axis. The first, therefore, restrict abduction and abduction of the sagittal axis, whereas the second ligaments restrict flexion and extension of the frontal axis. The total degree of mobility in flexion and extension measures uh, 170 degrees. Abduction is possible to an angle of 40 degrees. Abduction is to 20 degrees. As in all back cell joints, circumduction occurs here, too, when the tapes of the fingers described as sunk. Uh, the carpal metacarpal joints are formed by the second row of carpal bones at the base of the metacarpals. With the exception of the carpal metacarpal joint of the thumb, all these joints are plain articulations and are strengthened from both the dorsal and the palmar surfaces uh, by the tightly stretched dorsal and palmar carpal metacarpal ligaments. You may see uh, these ligaments on dorsal and palmar surface on these pictures. Um, sliding to the angle of Five, maybe 10 degrees to either side can occur. 
since the carpal metacarpal joints are very flat, possesses many facets, and have a strong articular capsule and ligaments. They are included in the group of the amphiartrosis. Amphiartrosis. You may see these joints on this picture in green. Green line. Which reinforce the root of the hand and decrease the resistance of the palm during the first movements of the multi-articular muscles, uh, the finger flexors. The four bones of the distal carpal row and the four metacarpal bones, second to fifth, uh, which are firmly joined by articulation permitting a little movement, form a whole firm base of the hand um, from the mechanical standpoint. The carpal metacarpal joint of the little finger permits somewhat greater freedom of movements. The articular surface of the base of the fifth metacarpal is almost saddle-like, as a result of which a little finger uh, can be opposed to the thumb by like this movement. A position, a little finger opposite thumb. Uh, but within a very limited range. The common cavity of the carpal metacarpal joints is encompassed by a capsule and is shaped like transverse clamp, uh, communicating with the metacarpal articulation as the intermetacarpal joints. These are unions between the adjacent bases of the last four metacarpals. The articulating surfaces of the bases of these bones are connected by means of strong ligaments. The interosseous metacarpal ligaments, ligamenta metacarpia interosse. You may see these ligaments on these pictures. The capsules of the intermetacarpal joints are reinforced by transversely uh, passing dorsal and palmar metacarpal ligaments. Next, we will talk about carpal metacarpal joint of thumb. You may see this joint on this picture. Uh, articulatio carpal metacarpi pollicis is absolutely isolated from the other carpal metacarpal joints and differs from them sharply in structure and movements. It's formed by the saddle shaped articular surfaces of trapezium bone, trapezium bone, you may see it on this picture, at the base of the first metacarpal bone, which are invested in the white articular capsule. Since its typical joint, it permits movements on two mutually perpendicular axes, a transverse axis passing through the trapezium bone and an anteposition, anteposterior axis passing uh, through the base of the first metacarpal. Flexion and extension of thumb together with the metatarsal occurs above the first axis, but since the axis is not absolutely transverse, the thumb is displaced toward the arm and in flexion and set in opposition to the little finger. Like this, I showed you this movement. The thumb is opposition uh, little finger. Uh, this movement is called opposition. You may uh, see this movement on this picture. Movement in the opposite direction is called Reposition. Movements on anteroposterior axis consist in abduction and adduction of the thumb to the index finger. Uh, I may show you abduction movement and abduction movement of the thumb. Uh, so the range of movement is uh, 45 60 degrees in abduction, and abduction is 35 40 degrees in opposition and reposition. Circumduction also takes place. Uh, the saddle joint of the thumb has evolved in the process of man evolution as a result of work performed. The metacarpal phalangeal uh, joints, articulationes metacarpio phalange, you may see that on this picture, uh, between the convex heads of the metacarpals bones 
and the facets on the base of the proximal phalanx are rather ellipsoid in character. The ligament apparatus consists of a loose capsule and two accessory collateral ligaments. You may see the collateral ligaments on this picture in these joints. Um, the ligament apparatus consists of a loose capsule and two accessory collateral ligaments, ligamenta collaterale, passing obliquely from the depressions of the radial and ulnar surfaces of the metacarpal fats to the sides of the base of proximal phalanx. On the palmar aspect of the capsule is a thickening containing a fibrous cartilage. The palmar ligament uh, connected with the thickening are strong fibrous ligaments, the deep transverse metacarpal ligaments, like ligamenta metacarpia transversa profunda, it's in Latin, um, stretched between the heads of the second to fifth metacarpals. And you may see these transverse ligaments on this picture. Movements at the metacarpal phalangeal joints take place in two axes, flexion and extension of a whole, uh, whole finger with a range of movements uh, in uh, 90 degrees, occurs on the transverse axis, abduction and adduction of the finger, a range 45-50 degrees occur on the anterior-posterior axis. The last type of movement is possible only when the fingers are in extension or when the collateral ligaments are relaxed. In flexion they are tightened and prevent side movements. Circumduction, circumduction of the finger in a quite wide range is also possible. Uh, next we'll talk about interphalangeal joints. Uh, articulationes interphalanges, manus, between the head and base of the giant phalanges are typical hunch joint allowing flexion at extension on transverse or frontal axis. The range of movements is uh, 110 degrees at the proximal interphalangeal joints and uh, 90 degrees at the distal joints. Accessory collateral ligaments, ligamenta collaterale, pass on the sides of the joints. So, at conclusion, we will talk about uh, hand's evolution. The skeleton of the hand, inherited by the ancient hominids from animal and sensor, changed in the progress of evolution. Uh, of men under the effect of labor. As a result, the following features characteristic of modern men appeared in it. First, enlargement of absolute and relative as compared to the other fingers, dimensions of the thumb bones, a saddle shape of the first carpal metacarpal joint, third, transposition of the thumb from the plane of the other fingers toward the palm as a consequence of which is opposition to the other fingers taking place in the saddle joint increase in range. Displacement in the same direction of the carpals, the trapezium and lanoid bones which are joined to the thumb. Shortening and straining out the phalanges uh, of the index middle, a ring and little fingers, which facilitates a variety of movements and the hand and its different parts. So, uh, we talked about uh, bone connections. Uh, thank you for your attention. I, see, I wish you all the best. See you again next time. Bye-bye.